the businesses of the future are going to be those that are able to build business around people's preferred methods of contribution. Hi, this is Trisha Ratliff. Welcome to my innovation podcast. Stephen, thank you for being here this morning. Everybody, I am here with Stephen Sanchez from Everyday Agile, who is also one of my colleagues. He is in Texas. I'm in Northern Virginia. And we've both been into not only Agile, but fostering innovation and facilitating collaboration for a long time. I became an Agile coach a little over 20 years ago. And uh, Stephen, do you want to talk a little bit about the work that you're passionate about and, and uh, your experience with Agile? And then we can just have a have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Trish. You know, it's really difficult for me to classify or categorize myself these days. It used to be really simple back when I can say, oh, I'm a software developer, or I'm a program manager, or I'm an executive coach. Uh, and now I do, uh, you know, or cybersecurity professional. And now I have the uh, the honor and the privilege to do all of those things in, in certain extents, focus around optimizing life experience and, and using business technology and culture as, as drivers for um, uncovering that for, for people and organizations. Thanks, Stephen. I thought a, a fun way to start this podcast would be to have just a nice, sincere conversation about what's on your mind that would be yeah. to you, because if it if it's important to us, it's probably important to our listeners who are dealing with some of the same challenges that we are. Where my energy is right now, and again, not losing focus of the goal, right, of of optimizing people's life experiences and organ, you know, organizational optimization of of flow and value to to customers. Where where my energy is right now, Trish, is understanding how the human intelligence and artificial intelligence um, overlap and integrating that into almost everything that I do, right? I've integrated AI into my coaching practices, um, into my creative practices. I'm almost viewing uh, artificial intelligence as a, a collaborative partner, right? So I'm almost thinking when you get Steve Sanchez, you don't get just Steve Sanchez, you get Steve Sanchez and his virtual AI collaborative team, so that that's something that's giving me energy right now and something that I think is highly applicable in the agile transformation spaces and personal transformation spaces. And of course, I'm still learning, right? And, and we have to be careful, you know, with, you know, artificial intelligence in its current state, that things like, you know, uh, some of the bias that's built into the to the training and, you know, even uh, some of the feedback I get is like, eh, that's not quite right, right? But I think that is the next evolution of of where we are as a society. And I also think there's a conversation somewhere around human consciousness and the ability to not just survive but thrive in a in an AI enabled world. Yeah, yeah. So let's take a step back and talk about that a little bit. Can you just speak really specifically about the logistics of how you're using? AI, how it's yeah. you, what some of the limitations are. Like, give me a specific example. What I one of the experiments that I'm currently running is um, I created a. It's about a 50 question survey, and so as a as a coach, uh, there are a few industry uh, frameworks that I and, and studies and self assessments that I that I like. Uh, for example, the Myers Briggs, uh, the um, VIA Strengths Assessment, the Values and Actions Strength Assessment, the Clifton Strengths Finders, um, Innovation as a Collaborative Game to be able to uh, understand uh, shared value systems and their interactions. So, I so what I did is I took those concepts and I actually used Chat GPT to help me understand the latent constructs behind those concepts. And a latent construct is is uh, uh, the, uh, an idea of of measuring concepts that are difficult to measure. For example, how do you measure love, right? And the way that the way that we do that is the concept of latent constructs and manifest variables to say how does how does love, for example, manifest in in real life in complex systems, and what are the 
uh, the multiple factors of causality for that manifestation of love, right? So you can kind of imagine, just imagine that web of rela- interdependencies in your head could get pretty complex pretty quickly. By creating these latent constructs, uh, I was able to identify the manifest variables of these various frameworks, like I, I had mentioned before, uh, the VI, you know VIA uh, strengths and uh, Myers Briggs, etc., and develop a common about fifty question survey that was about eighty five percent of accurate in in the return that I got from 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 Chat GPT. So for me, that was good enough as a starting point. And the reason that I did that is because I wanted to, I wanted the coaching to be personalized, right? I wanted, um, I wanted to interface with AI in a way that it, it understood uh, some element of who I am, how I, I won't say how I identify necessarily, but some of these standard frameworks that we use to measure, you know, how we optimize our, whether that's our optimizing our flow or optimizing our skills um, and, and, and ask AI to answer in context of my profile. So to customize those, those coaching responses, it helps me think through problems. Even if I've done the problem a million times before, right? As a coach, we go through and be like, oh yeah, you know, uh, we're, having trouble uh, uh, getting commitment from leaderships. Like, oh no, leadership commits. It's like, no, sponsorship is different than participation from leadership. All right, how do we solve this problem? It's like, well, lots of different ways to solve it, right? But what what AI has helped me do with my customized coaching profile is give me ideas on different ways that I could look at it, right? In different ways that might impact my coaching strategy with a client. Right. And that and that's just that's one example of how I use it as a coach, but the same type of profile could be set up for a client and help them kind of think through whether they're a scrum master or they're a product owner. It gives them not just general recommendations, it gives it provides recommendations that are that are customized to their pro to their profile. Stephen, how long did it take for you to set up? the AI to do that for you? Oh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I was like, wow, this would be a really cool. I wonder if this will work, you know, and then you get excited and then it's two in the morning and you're like, what am I doing? Still awake. Um, so, <laughs> so it, I would say, uh, I probably spent maybe at least a couple of weeks, uh, just thinking through like, how would I do, how might I do this? And, you know, figuring out, you know, the the prompt engineering, the prompt design is extremely important in doing this. And I've learned a lot, uh, as for, you know, as, as far as like how to sequence my words and structure my sentences in, in terms of prompt engineering. Now I can generate those profiles in minutes, if, if not, if not quick, you're not faster, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So empathizing with our colleagues who are either thinking of doing the same, maybe they've already started doing it. If they were wondering, should, should I do this? Or is it, you know, should I just use Steven or yeah. should, should we do it internally? What insight would you share to that? To well, you? I would always, yeah, for, for me, I'm all about collaboration, right? And I'm all about, <clears throat> you know, reuse if it's possible. I'm also all about uh, creativity and co-creation, right? So, you know, um, part of, you know, a, a, a mental resilience or an agile way of thinking is, yes, we want to create individually. We want that, you know, some people, for example, me, I, I get satisfaction out of that. Um, but I, but I'm also, uh, appreciate the beauty of, of co-creation collaboration and you in leveraging other, other people's knowledge and work. So I, I would say, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. You know, I I may even, you know, when I feel comfortable enough, publish, you know, my my queries right in a you know LinkedIn article or something else, just to share, right? If it's useful to to other folks, and and I would I would say, if if you're questioning it, try it, right? And and if uh, you know if it's available in terms of like you know, uh, prompts that are, that are kind of pre-constructed for you. I mean, we're talking about maybe a 30 minute investment, you know, and a little bit of uh, curiosity 
on uh you know behalf of the folk, you know people that want to try it i would say go for it yeah and i think it's an important thing to mention here that chat gpt sounds maybe technical to those who haven't tried it but it is very much like the google of today where you just have a prompt you put stuff in you can experiment and learn you can't break it really <laughs> <laughs> right it might yeah. break you so, but yeah. you can't break it no. <laughs> Break you in the sense that you'd get so excited, I guess. So, um, yeah, that it's really easy. Anybody can do it. Yeah. You, don't need, you don't need any specific or special technical skills. The The more you do it, the more you learn. And um, I do believe that it is helpful if you're not interested in reading the instructions to just mm -hmm. call a friend. Because yeah, for sure. It, but it's easy enough. It's, it's, I'm, the analogy for me is when you start playing a game, a really simple game, like the game Uno, mm -hmm. there are other games where you have to read the instructions. You have to really understand it. Right. But when you start playing Uno, somebody says, just sit down after the first hand, you'll get it. <laughs> That's right. You know, and it depends what house you're in. It's like, oh, well, in this house we play Uno. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so would you suggest that everybody try it or uh, you know i would say that if, with that that i you know i'm trying to trying to kind of help our listeners understand whether whether it's worth their time yeah you know i um i think it is worth the investment obviously um but you know what would what would motivate someone to to want to try it I, I would i would say that even if even if this is the first time you've heard of AI or chat GPT, this is an opportunity to learn a little bit more about yourself, potentially, right? With some of the, the feedback, even from the initial profile settings, um, it gives some useful insight. And, you know, I feel like it's especially important now, it, it, today's you know, you know, with the current settings and, you know, we're, we're past COVID now, but there's still effects, right? People, you know, psychological, you know, uh, uh, emotional impacts of COVID where people were, were doing some pretty deep exploration and what this could might do for, for folks that are, that are still uh, exploring that is put it in terms of uh, put a little structure around it, right? To say, Oh, I do see this strength manifest in my life. I wasn't sure what to call it, but now I know, right? And so it might, I mean, it, it, uh, it, if nothing else, right, it'll, I think it will, it could potentially uh, ignite uh, curiosity for, for in, you know, self-reflection. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for talking about AI not just with coaching, but I can easily see how they can use it for any type of decision making, mm -hmm. reflection, advice giving. That I'm Absolutely. thinking about a problem, and I generate, you know, I give Chat GPT some instruction about the the value system or the the ways that I want to make decisions. I want to look at something from a logical perspective, but I also want to understand the people or who it might impact. So when I ask this question about a challenge that I have, I want my values to be reflected in the questions, the prompts, and the solutions that the AI helps me come up with. So, Absolutely. So I'd like to shift topics just a little bit. I know mm -hmm. in the upcoming podcast, we have so much to talk about. So the question I'm, I'm going to ask is pretty loaded, but mm -hmm. we don't have to cover it all, right? Okay. Let's think about the people that we've been working with and um, empathize with their needs. Some of them are transitioning to agile, some DevOps, some are simply saying, look, I need more productivity. My resources have decreased recently. I need to get more out of the people that are working here with less. They're asking those questions in what I perceive to be the most positive way. They're not asking to wear people down what they really want is to create an environment where people can be more productive and do the best work of their lives, which is something that you and I are passionate about. So when we think about these patterns, what are some 
insight, advice, experience that comes to mind that you would say, hey, you know, the first thing we should all remember is or be aware of or you hear where I'm coming from? Yeah. What are some yeah. of the rocks that, mm -hmm. that we should never forget? And then maybe we can pull some of those threads when we talk again. Right. OK, cool. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is one of the success patterns is not thinking of people as resources, right? Thinking of people as people and building. And, and I know that sounds silly, right? But I can't tell you how many times I've been in organizations where leadership and, and you know, is, is speaking of people's like, oh, well, we have three resources on this team and three is like, no, 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 no. The, the the people are 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 your power they're your innovation they're your creativity and and it's essential to unlock that that creativity and innovation within these pe within these people right um so so for me uh, and, and and I understand right we have to align to business objectives and business values as well but I think we really need to be more cognizant um as a as a culture and as and again this might this is more my opinion and i'll i'll get to some of the more more practical stuff here just in a moment but i think the businesses of the future are going to be those that are able to build business around people's preferred methods of contribution and and what that means is truly knowing their people like truly understanding what their flow states are, what their strengths are, um, how the value systems align, so they understand what they're doing, why they're doing, or why they're doing what they're doing, right? That's that's building motivational systems around their workforce to really unlock and maximize their business, right? It's not business as usual; it's it's business of, of art of the possible, really, and we have to figure out how to do that as as a capitalistic society, at least, you know, to, you know, to have a return on investment as well as uh, not only, you know, monetarily, but also for our creators, for the people who, who actually do the work and for those that consume the, the products and services that uh, creators uh, generate. Right. So there's a, there's that win, win, win scenario as part of the innovation uh, as a collaborative game, Right. While there certainly is competition among uh, businesses and often within businesses, uh, we the the shift here is to move more toward cooperation and collaboration and move away from competition within organizations, within these uh, within the employee spaces. So that's one kind of design uh, or uh, organizational design pattern that um, I, I think over time needs to change. Mm -hmm. And there are human resource, uh, there are more uh, pro uh, progressive human resources. Like, I, in fact, I just went uh, to a, uh, it's called Hacking HR. It's a, like a, it's a LinkedIn meetup. And they're talking, they're, the conversations are happening, right? They're talking about, about these, unlocking this potential employees, like in a real way. You know, but in order for us to do that, we have to, you know, there are, there are changes in business and how contracts are written and, uh, you know, the way that money uh, is, or funding is funneled through the organization, you know, that, that needs to happen and it changes systemically that need to happen in order for, for this to, to be profitable for, for companies. And finally, I think that the, you know, some, org there are some organizations are, putting the pieces together and say, okay, it's, it's time for the shift, right? There's enough. We've hit a tipping point where it's now worth having this conversation. My guess is that it's been on their mind for quite a while and they've, they've known it's coming. I say they, right. Biz, you know, business has known it's, it's coming, but I feel like we're at a, at a tipping point now where these conversations are more, they're, they're more, uh, it's now the time to have them. Right. And I think that's, has, due to several combination uh, combination of things, I think it's a it's a newer workforce coming in. I think it's a new generation coming in, a different way of looking uh, looking at the world and making sense of the world. Um, so I'm I'm happy to see 
these changes in in how we're how we're growing people we're true you know having uh, where it's now economically there's a there's a there's the right structure in place in business or there's beginning to be the right structure in place to business to economically justify um unlocking this potential in employees and building business around employees rather than hey let's hire this wonderful smart person and make them the best in con in our business context so think of me for a moment as a leader who completely agrees with you and recognizes that we need to create a culture where we get the best out of people and uh, by by unleashing their energy and their potential and their their enthusiasm and giving them the resources that they need to succeed. But I know that somebody's going to say to me, well, why should I invest in that? So if I ask for money to, to get help, right? They'll say that all sounds very squishy and we just mm -hmm. need the latest software deployed. Right. Can speak to that a little bit and empathize with the needs of that leader who needs to justify that investment. Is there something small or tangible either as a first step or maybe something big, you know, that yeah. feels very solid, that feels very um, ROI oriented. How, can you speak to that, to that challenge that a leader has to justify the investment? And I ask this because I have spoken to leaders who maybe have billions of dollars on the line or just mm -hmm. hundreds of millions or a few million. And they say, yeah, there's no way I'll be able to get whoever, you know, whoever they're asking for, for approval, money, even 1% of what I'm spending, I couldn't even spend 1% just on culture and team performance because it's too squishy. So right. go ahead. Speak. Yeah, no, you know, and, and I think, and I get it, right? <clears throat> I think in those cases, we, you know, we we start with what is currently being measured and then question, are these the right measurements, right? And 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 even if they're not the right measurements, what do you think the right measurements are, right? So we always talk, I, I I have a tendency to think in terms of outcome versus output. And many times the the types of metrics, uh, success metrics in organizations are more performance-based metrics than outcome or impact-based metrics. And so that as a leader, what I would uh, offer to you is to start with where you're at um, because that's what's that's the language, the common language that you're going to be able to speak with those that that you're requesting fi uh, finances from, and then think about what it is that you envision that you want, right? And how would you measure that in terms of outcome? Whether that that might take the form of like an OKR, or objective key result, or just maybe a a goal or part of your own your organizational vision, and then find a way to work that into your existing system with existing funding to prove uh to either validate or invalidate your hypothesis right so you 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 here's your vision you believe that if you were to uh take a well, I'll just say for example there are there's a, a a team that is working on a particular project for a paying customer it the type of work that they're doing closely aligns to what your vision is and if you can show that by modifying some of the the behavior or the way the work is sequenced or accelerating feedback loops with a customer or you know integrating more human centered design or design thinking or sprints or systems thinking into their delivery and show that there is a an increase in the metrics that are currently being measured and here are the additional outcome metrics that <clears throat> validate or invalidate, hopefully validate your hypothesis. We don't want to like bias it, by the way, right? We want to be objective and fair in our measurement. But then that you have something more to add to the conversation. You say, yes, we're measuring this and we're showing success based on what you, your definition of success, right? The organizational, that what the, the business model currently, and it's it's not a blame game, right? It's just, it's data and experimentation. It, you know, so it's like, this is great. And here's the impact that we have. How do we measure impact in the current business model, right? So seeking clarity and in, in offering um, the outcome or impact, right? Has a tendency to be like, wow, so wait a minute, you not only showed progress toward the contract delivery, but your team also created 
you know, this new product or widget or service that resulted in a, you know, 30% increase in customer satisfaction survey. It, do I do I understand that correctly? Yep, that's right. And we can continue to do that. Here's how we did it. And we could continue to do that with this with this type of investment, you know, as part of our uh, investment horizon. You know, that that would be starting small with with what you have, being creative. And, you know, I'd also say that the people that that are going to be participating, you know, with you, it, this is this is an opportunity as a leader to really getting a little more engaged in in the sense of just enough structure for the team to self-organize, right? Maybe some mentorship opportunities for you and and really being a leader, right? To those, to those people by setting your vision, providing the the resources that they need, that the people need, and really just the support too. It's it's important for teams to know it's like, wow, I my executive or my leader, they don't, they don't just funnel money to me. They actually care about me. They really know me. They understand me. And they're giving me an opportunity to express myself in a, in a way that uh, I haven't been able to do in the past. You know, I I would even say there's a there's a return on investment internally on the team level, right? Because that the experience of that team may have increased as well, right? So now we're talking about savings in employee retention is, you know, in addition, the productivity and innovation that they create because they're motivated to to do that work as part of this process. What do you, what would you think as a leader, if I were to tell you that? That was a lot. Uh, honestly, I'm glad I recorded this because I'll have to go back and listen. So maybe we can um, maybe we can come back and shorten the answer because I know you were speaking extemporaneously. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. There's a lot. We need to. So maybe that's the biggest challenge is helping leaders pitch the level of investment that's necessary in a way yeah. that's solid. And uh, that's why I asked if we need to pitch something that's small and tactical so that those who are making the investment can say, oh, yeah, I see this. I see yeah. how it's working now. Yeah, for sure. And you, you know, and we can be tactical and consultative. This seems like a, a a problem worth solving. And you know, while we we address this on a case by case basis, you know, it happens over a conversation. You know, I think there there might be a, an opportunity here to uh, think about this as, say, a facilitated uh, a workshop. So, something like that, right? A, a, a virtual collaboration space or in, you know, in-person collaboration space where we can, you know, um, explore these ideas, right? And, and it's kind of a, it would be a cool, I think it'd be a cool little starting point for, you know, people who are interested in, in, in trying, you know, in, in to have that, have that or a similar problem, you know, it's kind of a, like a kickstart. It's like, all right, You've heard the conversation, you've heard the theory, right? The high level, the high level strategy, you know, behind this approach. Now here's a way for you to practice it and, and to, to do it. Steven, thank you. We've, we've talked about a lot. We've come to the end of our initial time box. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you for meeting with me this morning. Absolutely. Thank you, Trish.